You are listening to The Life Hack Show, a featured podcast of lifehack.org, where we teach you how to live your best life without sacrifice. I'm Allie Kramer, and today I'll be talking with Judy Foreman. Judy is a nationally syndicated health columnist who has won more than 50 journalism awards. She received a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and was a fellow in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School. Judy is also author of A Nation in Pain, Healing Our Biggest Health Problem, and The Global Pain Crisis, What Everyone Needs to Know. Her newest book, Exercise is Medicine, How Physical Activity Boosts Health and Slows Aging, is one you won't want to miss. Hi, Judy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, I'm very happy to join you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on aging and how we can extend our lifespan through exercise. Uh, This concept to me is pretty incredible and very hard to ignore given that we stand so much to gain by increasing our physical activity. That's really true. Yeah. (laughs) So let's dive right in, Uh, starting with understanding aging. I think a lot of people might not know as much about aging as they could. So could you um, kind of give our audience an idea of what aging is and maybe what happens biologically with aging? Sure. It, it's a big topic, but we'll just... Sure. Um, for one thing, probably the most surprising thing I learned when I was doing the research for this book is that aging, even though we think of it as inevitable, um, it actually isn't. There are some creatures on Earth that don't age at all. Really? Yeah. That means their cells, they're, they're just as likely to die one day after they're born as, you know, a hundred or a thousand days after they're born. We're so used to sort of the long, slow downhill slide Mm -hmm. that we think it's inevitable for all creatures, but it isn't. And, you know, who knows, maybe it wouldn't even be inevitable for us. Um, Nobody really believes that, but it's biologically potentially uh, a good hypothesis. Sure. Huh, that's, that's really fascinating to me, just thinking about how um, a lot of humans that I interact with, uh, you know, the, the first thing I start, started to hear when I was in my late 20s even was like, well, you're getting older, these things happen. But you're saying it's, it's not inevitable in, across all creatures, so there's a potential that we can do something about it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, A more reasonable goal for most people is what demographers call squaring the curve. That means extending the healthy part of the lifespan and then dying, kind of dropping dead more or less suddenly, but way later in life than you would otherwise. With exercise, you can increase the number of years that you're healthy and then minimize the amount of time. They call it compressing the morbidity at the end of life when you're, when you're not doing so well. So basically what we're after is a longer health span, more healthy years, and that in turn contributes to greater lifespan, longer, longer life period. So it's, you know, exercise is probably the magic bullet to both these things, longer years of good health and, um, you know, longer years period. So it's, it's both, you know, extends life and makes life much healthier. Great, great. So how much exercise would we need to engage in to see the benefits of it? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And it turns out the government guidelines, uh, which have been put together by exercise physiologists and physicians and other scientists, um, say 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So translated, 150 minutes, you can think of as 30 minutes a day for five days, which is pretty manageable. Sure. And moderate intensity exercise is when you're doing it, you can talk, but you don't have enough breath to sing. So you might be slightly out of breath, but you're not you know, gasping. Gotcha. Uh, but there's a couple of things that, that go along with this. First of all, that 150 minutes or 30 minutes a day doesn't have to all be done at the same time. You can chop it up into blocks of 10 minutes or whatever, uh, you know, walking to work and walking back to the car after work and, you know, walking around the supermarket. I mean, there's stuff you can do that seems pretty minimal, but that can add up or at least contribute to your 30 minutes. Um, the other thing is there is a kind of exercise that's sort of sweeping the whole exercise world. And your listeners may know about it already, but just in case they don't, I will tell them. Um, 
and it is 30 minutes. Um, it is uh, called high intensity interval exercise, which means you work really, really hard for say 30 seconds or a minute, and then you do a recover, recovery period of two or three or four minutes. And you go back and forth several times and do that for maybe 20 minutes in the gym or at your house. And you can get as much cardiovascular benefit from this high intensity stuff as you could from a much longer workout. So for people who say they don't have enough time, and this is a great alternative to work really hard, then recovery, hard recovery, hard recovery, back and forth a few times, and you can get huge benefits. Wow, that's incredible. So you're saying that this is just a plan I'm coming up off my head. If I take a minute or 30 seconds and do jumping jacks, and then yep. I do yoga for two minutes, and then 30 seconds of doing maybe even just squats or, or weight training, is, is that what you're talking about? Uh, th that is, in fact, that sounds excellent. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the idea is you, you want to get your heart rate up there, and I'm mm -hmm. sure jumping jacks will do it. I'm sure squats, especially if you do them fast and a lot mm -hmm. of them in a row. Uh, yeah, that would work. I do a, a simple thing. I just go in the treadmill and I increase my speed uh, for one minute, and then I slow it down for another minute, and I just go back and forth and back and forth. But that's me, and what you suggested would be just as good. Yeah. Oh, I love that idea too, because it's really making use of the treadmill as a stationary enabler for exercise that you can control the speed. Um, I, I really love that. I've always gotten very bored on treadmills, but I think that maybe that could be an interesting way to shake things up. Well, I have listened to many episodes of The Crown doing this. <laughs> <laughs> That's another good thing. Yeah. <laughs> or TV, TV. If you're going to watch TV, do it with an exercise. Do it on an exercise machine of some sort. That mm -hmm. way, you get both, and you're not just sitting there on the sofa. Sure. So, so would you say then that people that are maybe faced with, um, I don't want to say premature aging because I don't know the the jargon to use, but you know, someone that maybe is experiencing the effects of aging sooner than they expected, what would the causes of that be? Um, would there be anything outside of exercise? Well, I would, I would sort of quibble with, with your premise that people, people, some people think they're prematurely aging. I think we all think we're prematurely aging. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> it catches all of us by surprise. I mean, basically, uh, one definition of aging is the deterioration of virtually every body part, which, you know, as we get older, we sort of start noticing. But some, from a biologist's point of view, if you want me to go into this, there are actually nine very specific cellular and molecular hallmarks of aging. These are mostly microscopic things. You can't, can't see them the same way you can see wrinkles and uh -huh. kind of a sagging jawline, but um, they're very important. And it turns out that, um, that exercise can help make these go much slower. They retard the aging process at this very uh, cellular and molecular level. Uh -huh. On the uh -huh. sitting too much and eating too much makes these processes go even faster. So uh, you can tell me if you want to go into them, but we don't have to. I would absolutely love it. I find this fascinating. And I think it would help our listeners better understand, you know, this whole concept of aging and maybe debunk some, some myths that they have about it. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, it, it makes aging very real, which of course it is at the biological level. So basically, a team of European scientists identified nine cellular and molecular hallmarks of aging. And for the record, it sounds a little jargony. It is a little jargony, but I can explain some of the things. Um, they are genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteostasis, deregulated nutrient sensing, mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, and altered intercellular communication. Hmm. Now, if anybody can remember that from just listening on, <laughs> they're smarter than I am. Yeah, yeah. But I, I kind of see, I took a few biology courses uh, <laughs> in my time, and I can see how this could be applicable to something that maybe the general public would, would understand a little bit better as well. Yes. And um, I think it's, it's really good because it makes it real. Mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. a lot of evidence um, for the benefit of aging, uh, for uh, combating all nine of these like if you want to talk about um, epigenetics for a yeah. second, you can do that. Um, epigenetics 
is the word that refers to changes to the DNA that influence whether a gene is active or not. That is, whether a particular gene is turned on or off. That's different from changes in the DNA itself. Changes in the DNA itself are called mutations. These are things that happen to the DNA that make genes turn on or turn off. Um, one of the chief ways that influences what they call the epigenetic clock, which is a way of measuring your actual biological age as opposed to your chronological age, is a process with a jargony name, but it's called DNA methylation. Mm -hmm. And all, all this is really is a bunch of little chemicals called a methyl group, M-E-T-H-Y-L. And this cluster of little atoms um, latches on to various parts of the DNA in, in the genome along the chromosome. And when it lands in a particular place, it tells a gene to turn on or another gene to turn off. And measuring how much DNA methylation there is in your overall DNA uh, turns out to be a very good marker of how old you are. The more DNA methylation you have, the older you probably are. So it's like a really accurate underlying biological clock as opposed to your chronological clock. Interesting. But if I could add one thing to that that really, uh, this is my favorite little tidbit, um, Swedish researcher, researchers a few years ago uh, got a bunch of volunteers, in this case they were, they were all men, kind of hunky, you know, athletic looking guys, and um, they took muscle biopsies from, the, from both legs of each of these guys. That's where you just take a small sample of tissue to be able to analyze it under the microscope. And then they got the guys to ride exercise bikes in the lab three or four times a week for 45 minutes and then do that for several months. Then they took a bunch of muscle biopsies again. And then here's the tricky part. What they asked the guys to do on those bikes was just use one leg and just leave the other foot flat on the floor. And at the end of this experiment, it was just unbelievable. The leg that had gotten exercise had a totally different pattern of DNA methylation than the one that was non-exercise. That's wild. And the bottom line was essentially that the leg that got the exercise was younger physiologically than the one that didn't get exercise. That's absolutely incredible. So yeah. it's a perfect uh, control experiment. It's the same body, same food, same sleep, same habits, same everything. Just one part got exercise and one part didn't. Yeah. So how would you say epigenetics might affect the outcome of, of one's physical and mental aging? Well, it's, it's kind of, it's a it's a pretty good marker of mm -hmm. aging and in fact um, some parts of the body according to the epigenetic clock age faster than others uh -huh. like the heart could be 50 years old and the lung could be 30 and some ethnic groups age faster according to the epigenetic clock than others and men seem to age faster than women according to this clock huh. and even even more interesting in a way is when researchers study people who are over 100 years old, they're called centenarians, mm -hmm. um, their DNA methylation, their epigenetic clock looks like that of a much younger person. So the, these people who have you know, great genes that help them live a long time, their DNA methylation looks much younger than their chronological age. Again, kind of, kind of proof of the concept. Sure, sure. That's interesting. And, and, and do you have any thoughts on, say, someone sitting there and they're thinking, oh, that's wonderful, but I'm already so <laughs> aged and feeling awful. Is there anything that they, can they reverse kind of the effects of aging through exercise? Yes. The answer is yes. And also, it's never too late to start. Mm -hmm. If you haven't exercised for decades, it's not too late to start. It probably is a good idea to check with your doctor if you're going to just jump right in and mm -hmm. do hard stuff. But basically, every you know, more exercise is better than less. Uh, and and that's really true. But anything is better than nothing. And it's never too late to start. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to get scientific again for a minute, um, one of the other hallmarks of aging is kind of the pooping out, the falling apart of things called mitochondria. These are little, little organelles, little kind of baby organs inside our cells, and they're responsible for making energy. Mm. They, they help us take food from the table and oxygen from the air and turn it into energy, uh, specifically a molecule called ATP for adenosine triphosphate. And exercise mass produces mitochondria. Hmm. So when you 
when rat, rats or humans start running in cages or on treadmills, the muscles that you use for that activity end up creating more mitochondria, which ends up giving you more energy. And this, you know, this is directly exercise causes this to happen in a biochemical way. So even if you have an exercise and you start doing it, you'll again start building more mitochondria, even if you've been losing them for a long time. Wow, that's really cool. For uh, for some reason, it calls to mind like when I was a child and playing video games, where you would collect energy points, and <laughs> you know, kind of it would extend your game a little bit longer. And it really seems like maybe they're inspired by this this cellular activity here. That's yeah, really that's, cool. a, that's a good analogy. That's a great analogy. <laughs> so, so with this being said, um, it seems like everything is pretty interconnected as far as the human body and, you know, like how our, our body itself reacts to the aging processes or our environments. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on how exercise can help extend the health span and one's lifespan? Sure, but I, can, if I can go back to your first sure. point, um, it, it's really a very smart of you to talk about the interconnectedness of everything because it, it's amazing. I mean, when we contract our muscles, our muscles are actually little hormone factories, and they pump out they pump out hormones called myokines. In other words, hormones that come from muscles. And among the things that those do is they act on bone and bone. <laughs> Bone on its part secretes chemicals that act on muscles. It's kind of like one unit and they talk to each other biochemically. And the, the, you're completely right about the interconnectedness. Everything we do, it affects our lungs, it affects our heart, it affects our brains. And the chemicals are flying around bringing their good messages from one organ to another, uh -huh. uh, which is one reason that I'm not a big advocate of pills that are on the market or and coming on the market to be substitutes, supposed substitutes for aging, for, I mean, for exercise, mm. because the very interconnectedness that you were talking about is the essence of the whole process. And to just attack one piece of it wouldn't really work. Yeah, it's not going to work. And it makes me think about um, those who maybe suffer with osteoporosis. Um, and if, if their muscles were in better shape, it seems then that their bones could potentially be in better shape. Is that, is that, am I on the right track? You're definitely on the right track. Um, the, the message we've kind of gotten in the past few years, especially postmenopausal women, mm -hmm. is that weight bearing exercise will help make your bones strong. It, it turns out that that's not exactly the, the right message. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, when, in adolescence, when our bones are still growing and we're still growing, um, weight-bearing exercise is really important for building bone. But after a certain point, like after the end of adolescence, we're not so much building bone anymore as, as trying to preserve it. And exercise, re even weight-bearing exercise, basically doesn't build bone very much. But what it can do is help preserve the bone you've still got. Mm -hmm. And the, but the really important thing is not osteoporosis per se, mm -hmm. it's falling. Uh, ah. that, that's where the danger is. If you break your hip, there's a good chance you'll end up in a nursing home and then all that lying around leads to blood clots and it, you know, it's, it's a big yeah. problem. So avoiding falls turns out to be the real cru crucial thing. And the way to do that is also by exercise, but because it's because exercise builds your muscles and depending on the type of exercise you do can improve your balance. So both mm -hmm. better balance and stronger muscles help prevent falls. Gotcha. And that's, that's the key message in terms of exercise and bones. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Again, that interconnectivity. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But you asked before about ending the uh, health span and, and the lifespan. Yeah, yeah. Just any more information that you could kind of share with our audience, because I feel like you could talk about this for a very, very long time. But I think, you know, you have a very important message to deliver here. Yeah, I, I, I feel that it is a really important message. Um, basically, we, we talked before about uh, sort of the minimal requirements of, you know, 150 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. That is minimal, um, but it, and anything is better than nothing, but more is, is even better. And what, what the research has shown, and if people buy my book, which they can get on Amazon, um, 
you know, you can, there's tons of studies in the back of the book or, or links to the studies that you can look up. The, the data is just overwhelming about how exercise, if you do even just the, the regular basic stuff, you can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease by about 33%. Wow. And, Yes, yeah, so you can. Ex- chances of, of avoiding all cause mortality is about the same. It's a huge effect. It's a very, very effective way to to prevent and treat heart disease and and many other ills as well. Um, you know, the cardiac effects are the main reason we live longer because exercise actually helps you lower blood pressure, makes your blood vessels. Uh, more flexible and elastic. It increases what they call heart rate variability, which is the ability of your heart to speed up or slow down depending on the demands you're putting on it. And a whole slew of things, bl- things, blood lipids, everything. And exercise has its biggest effect on the health span and the lifespan because it's so powerful as a protector of the heart. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's fascinating. And we're talking about little changes that you could make, say, instead of taking the escalator, take the stairs, or taking the elevator, take the stairs, um, you know, incorporating physical activity into your daily life, making it become a habit, right? Yeah, I think personally that exercise has to be your default position. Like, uh-huh. it's non negotiable. You do it, and you only don't do it for some emergency or, you know, you Uh you had a meeting you had to go to and go straight to pick up the kids at daycare or something. Mm -hmm. But um, it has to be, it has to be non-negotiable. It has to be part of your day. That's a given that you don't even think about. It Uh just has to to work it in somehow. Yeah. Just like eating or sleeping. (laughs) Yes. Just like Mm -hmm. sleeping. So I'm thinking of all these people, um, maybe celebrities or, or anyone else that is notable um, that has kind of a, an ageless look to them. Granted, of course, there's plastic surgery and fillers and all these things that can happen. But would you say that in general, if, if someone has been exercising a good portion of their life or, or has started to exercise, that they would appear younger than those who would not? Oh, yeah. I don't know how old you are, but um, when you start going to your high school reunion or college mm-hmm. reunion, like even in your 40s, mm-hmm. you, can, you can look around and you can tell some people look a lot better than others. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, for the record, I'm 38. So I, I'm right about that cusp <laughs> where <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm watching kind of the youthful looks of everyone around me disappear, including myself. Um, oh. But you're right. That there's noticeable differences among people. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, one of the biggest differences with, that we observe is, is obesity. And uh, it, there's an obesity epidemic now. And hand in hand with that goes the diabetes epidemic. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, exercise is a huge way to combat both of those. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, I have a whole chapter called Sitting Kills. And <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, and people say sitting is the new smoking, and that's absolutely true. And one of the reasons is because it does tend to lead to this visceral fat. That's not just the fat you can pinch on, around your stomach, but it's it's also the fat that's inside that you can't see or feel, mm. the kind of fat that surrounds your organs. And one of the reasons that's so bad, aside from the um, people not wanting it for aesthetic reasons, is this fat turns out to be not just a lump of lard, it's um, actually a metabolic organ, you know, like like muscles. Wow. That fat tissue pumps out hormones, and those hormones um, are called cytokines, and they are pro-inflammatory molecules that travel around the body, creating inflammation. Mm-hmm. And inflammation, I mean, inflammation is a good thing if you're, you know, you cut your finger and you see your finger turn all red and right. swollen. But chronic inflammation all over the body is, is really dangerous. And that leads directly to atherosclerosis and um, di- diabetes and neurodegenerative problems. Um, inflammation is a really big culprit in all this. And that's one reason why it's so important not to be obese and to lose weight if you can. If, if you already are obese and exercise, exercise alone won't help you lose weight, but it's sort of a good way of buttressing your diet and exercise can help keep you from getting obese in the first place. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And I know that when I'm spending, um, I try to exercise every day. I've, it's been something that I've just kind of 
it's been ingrained in me since I was a child, luckily. Um, but when I don't exercise, I notice that I'm, I'm so much more hungry for, for worse foods or, you know, junk foods. I just feel worse overall. And I can see how I could really get into a pattern of going down rapidly in my health because of how exercise, again, affects everything. Um, it really does. It really does. And, and you know, it, it's lifestyle that um, makes things so bad because, you know, we are actually genetically programmed to move around. I mean, we have the same genes as our early ancestors who, you know, they had mm -hmm. to really hunt for their food, not just go to the supermarket. Sure. And they were, you know, we are, we are built to move. We are not built to sit in front of screens all day. And um, you're right. It, it's kind of abnormal, the, the westernized lifestyle that we have now. I mean, that, that wasn't part of the deal evolutionarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And surely it has to have effects beyond, I mean, we've talked a lot about the physical effects, but, um, and I guess the brain is part of that, but mentally, I'm sure it has an effect as well. Um, can you elaborate maybe on how exercise could affect different um, mental capacities, even uh, depression or anxiety? Yeah, I mean, that's my favorite part of the book, actually, um, is I have two chapters on the brain. One chapter is on cognition, which is mm -hmm. kind of the thinking, intellectual judgment stuff. And the other chapter is on mood, specifically depression. And the thing that really intrigued me is exercise actually produces a chemical in the brain that acts in a good way for cognition and for mood. Huh. What happens when you exercise is your brain pumps out a chemical that uh, some scientists call miracle grow for the brain. It's actually, it, it's, hmm. it's, you know, jargon name is um, BDNF, which stands for brain derived neurotrophic factor, which just means brain derived, comes from the brain. Neurotrophic means it acts on nerves. So the brain makes this chemical in response to exercise. The chemical goes to a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is the memory center, and literally makes new nerve cells grow. Mm -hmm. It's called hippocampal biogenesis, if you want the, the technical term. And it's fascinating. Exercise makes a better hippocampus, and that mm -hmm. leads to better memory. And the data is overwhelming uh, and very encouraging for exercise. There's some studies well, first of all, exercise is seen as the number one modifiable risk factor for preventing Alzheimer's. Wow. And a Canadian study showed that if everyone who is currently not exercising began exercising, we could get rid of one out of every seven cases of Alzheimer's. That's, that's incredible. Huge. That's huge. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And depression, it's also very, very powerful. And it's the same chemical, the same miracle grow, BDNF. Um, it seems to work in tandem with a chemical people have heard about called serotonin to help prevent and treat depression. Mm -hmm. In a number of studies, um, exercise is as good and in some cases better than medications for treating depression. Mm. Um, I mean, not to say if if, you, if your listeners are, or some of your listeners are feeling seriously depressed, they should obviously talk to their doctor about it. And medications should and can be used, and, and that's great. But exercise is free, cheaper, <laughs> none of the side effects of the drugs, and um, in many cases, just as effective, or at least if, if not by itself, in good uh, synergistic cooperation, if you will, with the medication. Sure. And you get the physical benefits as well. Yeah. That's Plus interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's some studies that show that people who are fit earlier in life are much less likely to get Alzheimer's and or depression later in life. That makes sense. Their cells have had to work less hard to combat that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, because even for people that aren't, say, suffering from uh, acute anxiety or depression or anything like that, that they could really pinpoint. Even if, say we have this listener and says, oh, I feel great and I don't exercise. You're basically saying if they, if they, uh, if they began an exercise regimen, whatever job they have or whatever, maybe even relationships they have, their mind would, would work better. Therefore, yeah. they, they would function better and be better performing at their jobs or within their family or friends or pretty much anything that they're doing. That's exactly right. 
that's, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I don't know how many people there are out there who are saying, wow, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a good point. <laughs> Going for extremes here, but I mean, it's it really speaks volumes to say even if you feel like you have everything going for you, you don't need to exercise. It's, it can still benefit you in ways that you don't even understand. That's right. Although my book would help you understand it. Sure. Um, but it's um, yeah, you know, even if you feel good, why not feel better? Yeah. So let's jump into that. Um, before, before I let you go, let's talk about some of the key messages of your book, Exercise is Medicine, How Physical Activity Boosts Health and Slows Aging. Um, and, you know, what, what the audience could kind of find within it and look forward to learning about. Well, I mean, I've, I've written the book in a way so that if you're not interested in science, you can kind of skip over those parts because you can still get the, the main messages. I also include a lot of little vignettes of people, most of them older, who do phenomenal exercise things. And I, I find those little vignettes very inspiring, even though I've read the book a million times. Sure. <laughs> uh, basically, the message is, is, is pretty clear. Start and don't stop. Because... Yeah. It doesn't take that much. Just get off the couch. Sitting does kill. Um, and the other thing we haven't talked about is you lose fitness very, very fast. If you stop exercising for two, three, four weeks, you'll lose 25% of your fitness. I mean, that's a lot. That is a lot. So you have to be consistent. You have to be consistent. Yeah. Last month's exercise uh, is better than if you hadn't exercised, but you, but you have to keep at it. That's why it's so important to build it into your life and make it the default position, make it non-negotiable. It's right. much easier that if you don't have to talk yourself into it every time. The other thing that, you know, I don't go into in, in great depth in the book, but there's a lot of data suggesting that um, if you exercise in groups or make it a social thing or, you know, make a commitment with a friend to walk at a certain time every day, then even if you're thinking, oh, I don't want to do it today, the friend is there waiting for you at the street corner. Okay, better not let her down or him down. Right. Yeah, you have accountability to, right. to make sure you get out there and do it. And that's much cheaper than having, you know, a personal trainer or something that I think a lot of people feel they need to do. But as you're saying, exercise, I mean, it could happen anywhere at any time. It's just a matter of mindset. Yeah, you can dance around your living room. You can hop around while you're washing dishes. You can, you know, jump around while you're folding laundry. I mean, and at the very least, you can stand up every hour or so if you're watching TV. Go get a cup of coffee, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, go, you know, check on the kids or something. Um, you know, just, just not sitting for long periods of time is really, really good for you. And I personally, I'm not, I don't get any money from Fitbit or Apple Watch or for anybody for that <laughs> but um getting those those devices that you wear and count your steps those they really motivate people a lot sure sure i yeah absolutely because it, again it's kind of accountability and you can see the progress that that you're you're making and i'm i'm thinking and i, I don't want to get off on a tangent right before i i cut this episode off but i'm thinking about an office environment and for for maybe our listeners that are managing offices um, you know, think about how much more productive your employees could be if you scheduled, uh, you know, physical activity breaks or didn't require your your employees to just sit stagnant in an office or a cubicle for, you know, eight hours a day with only a little break in between. A lot of people work through their lunches. It's got to be pretty impactful on their mental health. Yes, yes. And actually, one of my proudest accomplishments when I was a reporter at the Globe was I helped talk the Globe into putting a gym in the bed in the basement. That's amazing. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'm sure it helped so much. And the other thing people sometimes do in the office environment is, um, you know, if it's just a couple of people, you can have a walking meeting. You know, you can go for a walk, uh, even just back and forth to the cafeteria or something and have your meeting walking around with somebody instead of just sitting down in their office. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And another good thing that I love about walking and talking is that you can really concentrate on what you're saying and not necessarily the person's reaction because you're focusing on where you're going. So you can get a little bit freer in your thought while doing that. It's yeah, and the other trend that seems to be happening is a lot of people are working from home these days. Mm -hmm. So 
frankly, you can get up and take a 20 minute break and your boss might never know. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and it would be all the more benefit for your boss and your work is going to be so much better. Right. Plus you can tell, you can brag about it to your boss. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is amazing stuff, Judy. Um, so let our listeners know, I know you mentioned Amazon, um, where they can pick up the book, Exercise as Medicine, How Physical Activity Boosts Health and Slows Aging. Amazon is probably the easiest because people know it, but I also have um, some weird, a buy now thing on my website so people can click on that and buy it. And my website is judyforman.com, which is J-U-D-Y, F as in Frank, O-R-E-M-A-N.com. Don't forget the E in the middle there. And it's F-O-R-E-M-A-N, JudyForeman.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Judy. This is, this is an incredible episode. Um, you've given me a lot to think about and hopefully our listeners as well. And it's definitely the kick in the pants I needed to up my own physical activity. <laughs> well, I can't afford not to, right? Hey, I just got back from the gym, so I understand. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, to all of our listeners, be sure to pick up a copy of Judy's book, Exercise is Medicine, How Physical Activity Boosts Health and Slows Aging, and start changing your life today. And for more information, visit her website, judyforeman.com. That's J-U-D-Y-F-O-R-E-M-A-N.com. That wraps up today's show, and stay tuned for the next episode. Are you plagued by the problem of procrastination? If so, you're not alone. Procrastination affects people from all walks of life, and we have the solution. Check out our free fast track class, No More Procrastination, and discover the triggers that power your own behavior and learn how to defeat this problem head on. Register at www.lifehack.org backslash focus dash fast dash track.